So hello everyone and welcome to this semester's Eye on Africa. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs, African Studies Center at Michigan State University. And for those of you who don't know, Eye on Africa is our weekly seminary series. So every Thursday at noon, we invite uh, a scholar who does research on Africa to come and share their research finding with the MSU community. And for this semester, most of our talks are gonna be around issues of human rights, social justice. And we have scholars all over the world from Africa, Europe, the US of course, but also the Caribbean who are gonna come and share their research findings. So we hope that you'll be able to join us uh, as many times as, as you can. Uh, so our guest today is Dr. Asanda Benya from the University of Cape Town. And her talk is titled, The Demands for a Living Wage, The Invisible Woman in South Africa's Platinum Mining Belt. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Benya, I want to recognize uh, and thank the MSU Center for Gender in Global Context for co-sponsoring this talk with us, African Studies Center and helping us get uh, the word out. So thank you, Jensen. Uh, now a brief introduction of our guests. So Asanda Jonas Benya is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cape Town. Her work focuses on the intersection of gender, class, and race. Her current research is an ethnographic study of women underground miners in South Africa's platinum mines and looks at the construction, construction of gender subjectivities of women in the underground mining world. She has published in labor and feminist journals in areas of women in mining, gender, and the extractive industries. Uh, labor and social movement, social and economic justice, so all that are uh, her subject of research. She is the recipient of several awards and fellowships, including the African Humanities Program Fellowship 2019 and the Atlantic Fellowship on Racial Equity 2018. She serves as an editorial board member of the Ubuntu Dialogue Project. She is also active outside of the university as a board member of several national NGOs, such as the Surplus People Project, the Benchmarks Foundation's Independent Problem Solving Service Advisory Board and Workers World Media Production. Dr. Benya, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here today and welcome. So I turn it on to you now. Uh, thank you so much, Awa, and thank you to Nicole and uh, thank you one for the invitation. And also for those who are in attendance, I know that in the US today, uh, there's a lot that's going on. And so I'm very aware that people could be, could have chosen to be elsewhere. And I also know that a lot of people are managing a lot of things, COVID related and so forth. So I'm very, very grateful that there are people who've come to join our conversation today. And as you've already said, I'll be talking about these demands for wages and mainly the invisible women when we're talking about that. I do my research in mining industry in South Africa, focusing primarily on women. So mines and women, that's mainly what I'll be talking about today, but really focusing on women. I'll give a brief background on uh, these women, but also on these mines and a particular event that has shaped a lot of the political, socio-political landscape in South Africa. Uh, and this event is around mining. It was actually a massacre that happened in 2012. So I look at these invisible women and the work that they did around that massacre and the work that they continue to do in their community. Uh, I think you had mentioned, our that part of the theme for this month, I think, or generally of these talks is social justice. So uh, talking about this massacre in light of social justice, what's happening in this community, but while I'm focusing on this community, really, I'm talking about a whole lot of other communities in South Africa. I'm talking about a whole lot of working class communities, workers issues and so forth. So I look at that town, look at women, look at these experiences. But before I start, let me maybe tell you briefly 
uh, really briefly about this mining town, but also about the Marikana massacre that happened in 2012 and why it was such a seminal moment for South Africa and how that uh, Marikana massacre gave prominence to this town, at least in terms of socioeconomic and political struggles in the country. To a point where if you say Marikana in South Africa, it doesn't matter where you are in the country or what you're talking about, there's certain things that pop in people's heads because Marikana resonates a lot, uh, but also resonates a lot in relation to demands that people have been boldly making in the past few years, demands for living wage, demands for decent work and all sorts of things, right? So it's this small mining town. So as I said, I'm talking about Marikana, but I really want people to think not just about Marikana as I talk about this, because part of the research I've been doing in the past few years and some of my colleagues have been doing also shows that the story of Marikana is not just a story of Marikana, but it's a story of many other small towns in this country, many other working class communities in this country. It's the story of labor. It's the story of police brutality, something that I think a lot of you can relate to, those who are joining from the United States, certainly. It's the story of neglect of poor Black people. Uh, it's the story of production and sustenance of exploitation and poverty wages by large corporations in South Africa. And I think it resonates with other parts of the continent where we have large mining corporations. It's the story of mine workers, but my focus is really going to be that story of women and resistance at all of these different intersections. I'm not going to touch on all of them, but I think I want people to just keep that as a frame of what I'll be trying to talk about. Later on, towards the end, I'll show a video, and I'm hoping that the video where you'll hear the women that I'm talking about speak for themselves, We'll sort of bring everything together. I'll give the background and I'll share a little bit about some of these experiences that I said I want to explore today. And I don't think I'll have enough time to do justice to all of those experiences, but I'm hoping that the video brings a lot of what I'll mention uh, uh, to like it will help concretize it. Like I've already said, it's the story of this neglect, it's the story of people in power and how they abuse their power and exploit poor people. It's also a story of our government and the ways in which we need to keep accountable our government. And I think for a lot of you, again, in the US, you know exactly what I'm talking about, keeping governments accountable. But it's also, and equally, and I'm mentioning this particularly because of the audience of today, it's also a story of shareholders who siphon profits, dividends from our countries. And those shareholders, majority of them are located in the north, in the west, so-called north, so-called west. And I'm mentioning this because I think there's a conversation to be had about solidarity across the oceans of activists, of students who care about social justice, about holding our governments accountable, but also holding shareholders accountable. The German colleagues that we're working with in relation to this particular Marikana massacre where we were trying to hold shareholders accountable in Germany for something that they did in South Africa. And activists in Germany were very central in, in doing a lot of the groundwork in Germany. And I'm sharing all of this to say, what can we do between our countries if we're talking about social justice, considering the fact that it's not just our government that need to be held accountable, but it's also the shareholders who together with our government, siphon these interests, these, dividend, uh, uh, these dividends out of our countries, out of these communities that I'm gonna be talking about today. Also because I think when we're talking about mining in, in Africa, in South Africa, it's not just mining here. We know that these global production net, these production networks are operating on a global scale. They're global production networks, they're not localized. Yet I think a lot of times our struggles for social justice they remain very much local or at best very much in, on a national scale and I think it's important we draw connections as people who care or who are concerned about social economic political justice across the oceans and not be limited by the scale of our geographies but really make connections using these global production networks that capital makes so visible for us. So what then is the story of Marikana and the women of Marikana generally? I'll give a very brief background uh, and then we'll play the video and I'm hoping that we can have a conversation after that. The story of Marikana, like I've already said, it's the story of this mining town. 
in a small platinum producing region. And this, it's a very small town. We can go to the next slide. I think you'll see the map in that next slide. It's a very small region and it produces about 40 to 60% of the world's platinum production. So it's producing quite a lot. And I want you to keep this in mind as we, as I talk about the struggles of these communities, the fact that this is a small region, but it's producing massive, massive amounts of platinum for the world. And I'm not saying this to glorify mining, but I'm saying this to contextualize the struggles of people in these communities. If it's 40% of the world's platinum production, what does that mean for the money that people are making out of this community? But also what does it mean for the people who are living in these communities? So in this town, particularly the one that I've highlighted in blue, that's a province. And in that province, there's Marikana right top north, northwest part. There's Marikana and in 2012, mine workers, rock drill operators to be specific, they went on strike demanding a living wage, not the meager wages that they had been earning, that their grandparents had been earning for 50, for 60, for 80, for 100 years since the dawn of mining in South Africa. These workers, what was unusual about this demand for a living wage is that unlike in previous times where people had demanded a percentage increase, they were demanding a specific amount. And this was like double some for some workers, three times what they were earning. And they were saying, we're not backing down, we're demanding not just an increase, but we're actually demanding a living wage. Back then when this strike took place and when the massacre happened, that living wage in US dollar terms, it was about 1,250 US dollars. In today's term, it's about 850 US dollars. Previously, they had been earning in that, like in 2012, it was equivalent of 450 US dollars. In today's times, we're talking about 300 US dollars, 250 US dollars around about. So it was important because they were demanding a percent, not a percentage increase, but a specific amount to take home. These workers occupied a hill for days demanding that their employer comes to address them and respond to these demands for a living wage not just a wage. And there was a lot of back and forth with employers negotiating, trying to get out of paying workers this living wage. Um, but workers were very adamant. They were very resolute saying that Asijiki, meaning we're not turning back, we're demanding this living wage. So it was a strike about a living wage, but I think it's important again that we draw connections between the wage and the crisis of social reproduction that we have seen, not just in this mining town, but in the country. And I think globally, that's what literature is saying. This crisis of social reproduction, the crisis in the reproduction sphere, that people were no longer able to support their families. They were no longer able to afford basic needs. Um, even though they were working in mines under excruciating conditions, working long hours in dangerous and inhumane underground conditions. Wives whose task is to spread thin these mining wages were failing to make ends meet. Children of mine workers were not able to even eat, yet this is the region that is producing the world's platinum. Some were not even able to complete high school, let alone go to tertiary education and healthcare was also in a bad state. And I'll get into some of these details, but it's just to outline this crisis of social reproduction and why the strike was so important and why the strike has changed our country in such a big way. The frustration caused by these work, uh, frustration caused by the wages rather, these very low wages were not, was not then, felt just by workers, but it was also felt really by the community. And so part of what I'll be talking about is how this community supported workers and how the community continues to support workers because they felt the strike, they felt the frustration of being paid very, very low wages. What was not anticipated, however, when we're talking about the Marikana massacre and the Marikana strikes and what's happened in the Marikana community since then was that we were not expecting a massacre, especially in a democratic country. What was not expected, what was not anticipated by people was the killing of workers, 
for exercising what in South Africa is a constitutionally enshrined right, a right to peacefully demonstrate, a right to strike. But also what was not anticipated was this brutality with which the police uh, met workers who were demanding a living wage. So instead of the employer meeting with workers, negotiating properly, calling the police to come and remove workers from a hill that is located in a community. So the brutality with which the police removed workers resulting in a massacre is something that was not anticipated. And after the massacre, what we also did not expect and what still shocks us to this day is that the fact that the blame was actually put on workers whereas it was the police who fired and killed workers. And the victimization of workers afterwards and their families, the victimization that they were subjected to to this day. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. This brutal attack, this massacre I'm talking about or that I'm, I'm using as a context for the work that women are doing that's invisible, this massacre happened about 300 meters away from people's homes. That's about three or four blocks at most from people's homes. It was a hill that's located between a workplace on one side, a hill in the middle, and on the other side, a community. So as workers were being shot, were being massacred, as guns, as stun grenades were being thrown, people in the community were watching all of this. They were witnessing all of this. And as I said, instead of the employer coming to negotiate with workers, the employer reached out to the government and again, which is why I was saying at the beginning, there's a conversation I think we need to have between a bit because I think we need to hold responsible or accountable our governments, but also these employers, these large corporations. So two rounds of firing happened around this massacre day after days and days of workers striking, occupying this hill that's outside of work. Two rounds of, fire, of firing and about 17 people in the first round were killed. And the second round, 20 minutes later, another 17 people, about 34 people in one afternoon were killed for demanding a living wage. What was striking about this is that all of these people were shot on their backs while running from the police. So it was effectively a state-sponsored massacre. The closeness of the hill where the people, where the workers were that the workers were occupying is really very chilling because it's so close to the community. It's chilling, but also very important as, the, as I do my research in this community, as you walk past the community and as you walk past this hill, it's as if you're walking past a haunted killing site. The proximity of this hill and the community and the shaft is what makes Marikana a very curious case for me. And I think it also nudges us to see not just the strike when we're talking about Marikana, not just that one day, but also things that have happened, which is what we things that have happened since the Marikana day, which is why in 2021, I'm still talking about something because it's that happened in 2012, because it's shifted so much uh, in, in our country, in the socio-political landscape of the country. And I'm going to get into those when I talk about some of the work that women have been doing or some of the things that have been happening in the community. But this proximity, it forces us not just to think about the strike, but also to really see the community, to see the labor issues as connected to work, to, to, to community issues, to see families, to see women, and all of these, when we're talking about labor struggles, generally, these are people, these are communities that are often invisible because labor struggles or workplace issues are usually, it's just the workers. But I think because the Marikana massacre happened and the Marikana strikes pre the massacre, because they happened in a hill that was located in a community where workers and where people in the community could see what was happening and they were supporting the strikes weeks, days before the massacre happened. It helps us then this location, this proximity to draw these connections in a very interesting way, uh, unlike, community, unlike struggles that happen within workplaces where uh, the community is far off or is closed off or where the family is far removed with Marikana, all of these are really close to each other. And the Marikana massacre is, 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 is curious for me also partly because of that. 
the hill, as I've already said, is situated in this very interesting place and really close to the, the settlement where workers reside. What is also important about this uh, location of the hill where the massacre took place is that it also allowed community members to be involved. So it is not just making them visible because they are nearby, but visible because they participated in the strikes, visible because they were very central in the strikes that happened before the Marikana massacre. They were very central around the massacre. They were very central post the massacre. And when we talk about the changes that have happened, the community is a very central part of that story. Women are a very central part of that story. So we see women then, their involvement because of this proximity and their participation. We see it pre the massacre. We see it during the strikes. Yes, that's the heel. Sorry, I forgot to say you can change the slides. That's the heel where this took place and the demands for a living wage, uh, the 12,500 rands, which back then was about 1,250 US dollars and about now it's about 840 or 900 US dollars. So the women in Marikana were involved then. They were involved and they continue to be involved pre the strike, as, around the strike, as I've said already. And I'll go back to this involvement around the strike because part of some of the work I've been doing around social reproduction is to show how mines directly benefit from the work that women do on a daily basis in these mining communities, yet they are not remunerated. I'll get into that later though. Some of the work that women were doing pre the Marikana massacre during the strikes, it was seen really as supportive work. So they were servicing the strike in some way by cooking for men who were on the mountaintop, by cooking for people in the community, holding vigils with community members, offering emotional and spiritual support for families whose husbands were no longer, or brothers or siblings were no longer going home because they were occupying the hill. After the Marikana massacre, there was a big shift in the role of women. People were killed, about 34 people were killed. Workers were trying to organize themselves. The women in Marikana, what they did soon after the Marikana massacre, so you have 34 people killed, about 70 people injured in hospital and others, 270 people injured and in hospital. And you have others who are in hospitals, others who are in morgues, in all different places. So the community, there were literally no people who had initially been on the hill. They were either arrested, some had died, massacred, others were in hospitals. So it was women who kept the strike going, who continued protesting, demanding uh, that workers who had been arrested be released. It was women who went to court because all men, either in all these three different places that I've already mentioned, it was women who were outside the courts protesting, demanding that there be fair trial for workers. But most importantly, and this is something that when we talk about the Marikana massacre, it's often forgotten. Women were amongst the first people to call for a commission of inquiry. They were amongst the first people to say that the government needs to investigate how workers demanding a living wage can be massacred so close to their homes for demanding what was fair to them. So that's, that's very important to keep in mind this, this work that women were doing before the massacre, but also after the massacre, keeping the strike going. What is also important about this proximity uh, of the Marikana massacre hill and the, the women, as I've already said, is the women, but not just women for the work that they were doing, but also because women are visible in this as reproducers of labor power and of labor in these mining communities. And it is this role of women as reproducers of labor power and of labor that stirred them into action that made them join these strikes and other frontline activities. Their everyday experiences, their daily interfaces with the mine, but also with poverty, even though their partners were working in the mines, due to their low wages though, this interface with poverty, living in squalid conditions, constantly striving to make ends meet, waking up 
early hours of the morning searching for water for their men folks so that they are ready to go underground yet struggling to put food on the table. These are all the things that stirred women and made them join, support the strike, but also play a very central role in these strikes. So the demands for a living wage then by workers in Marikana, they were seen by women as their own struggle, not just something that the workers are demanding that's far removed from them, but as something that resonated with them. They were doing all of this unrecognized, invisible work, but also they were the ones who were making these ends meet financially, but failing to make ends meet. So they really resonated with the struggles uh, around Marikana, the calls for a better life, for better, decent uh, wages, a life that can only be achieved if workers are earning a decent wage or a living wage, as they called it. So these women then, they were not outsiders or external, but they were directly impacted by the demands that workers were making. And maybe just a point a note on methodology, I thought I was going to touch on this earlier, is that a lot of the data I'm sharing today was gathered through participant observation, and uh, but also through particip participatory action research and interviews of women, that, with women that I was working with, because when I did this research, when the Marikana massacre happened, I was doing my PhD around the Marikana area. And when it happened, I was also working, doing participant, participant observation in some of the mines for about a year. So when it happened, I was around the area. So I knew, so a lot of what I'll be presenting, what I'm talking about today comes from that data. But what I wanted to underscore on that methodological note is that working underground for me, did not only expose me to the highly technical side of mining and these market driven production targets that are often set by management, but also to the physically excruciating, mentally unforgiving work in the hot and humid conditions underground with rocks that are constantly threatening to fall. But also it exposed me to the work that workers do in addition to their day-to-day -day work underground and the, as mine workers generally, the work of navigating and negotiating, not just the dangers underground, but the work of negotiating uh, bad treatment by mine managers, humiliating, condescending uh, treatment by usually very young white mine managers, all for the sake of providing for their families. So it was clear then when I was doing this research and when I started working with these women that these workers, I mean, their work, that the sacrifices underground at the rock face were not met by similar sacrifices from their employers. That's just a note I wanted to make on the methodology. So who are these women then that I wanna talk about today? There are three or so four groups of women in the Marikana story, but because of time, I'll just focus on one group the first group of women, uh, I'll tell you though about all of these different groups, but I'll focus on the first group. And the first group of women are those who live in Marikana in this community, who do the social reproduction daily work, who reproduce this labor power of workers. The group who witness and who are the ones involved in this social reproduction, they're closer. So these are called usually in literature, the town women in mining literature coming from South Africa. These are called so-called the town women, the ones who are closer to the mines. There's a second group of mine of people, of women, but I'm not going to go into them and the work that they do. But these are the women who are working inside the mine. So these are the women mine workers. The third group is women who are living in labor sending areas that are far away from the mines whose brothers, whose fathers, whose husbands work in the mines. These are the women who are connected to the mines through their husbands or through their brothers. And they too, they do social reproduction work, but from afar, they're not producing or reproducing the labor power, but they are reproducing labor in a very literal sense in that they, these are women from labor sending areas. So they're the ones who give birth to people who ultimately become mine workers. But I'm not gonna talk about the workers. I'm not gonna talk about these women who are, talk, who are reproducing labor from afar, the ones who are, but I'm gonna talk about the first group, the ones who live in these mining communities and the work that they do and how that work is invisible. But there's also another group 
the group of women who lost husbands, who lost brothers, who lost fathers uh, after the Marikana massacre. I'm still also not going to talk about them. So as I've already said earlier, in the early stages of the massacre, women's involvement was seen as supporting workers. But really when you unpack, when you begin to unpack the work that women were, were doing, it was not just supporting workers. They were quite directly and actively involved in what was happening in Marikana. So as I've said earlier, holding vigils, supplying workers with food, credit to make phone calls, and also proactively going closer at least to the Marikana massacre hill to support workers, giving them moral support. And as I've already said, they're the ones who kept the strike alive after workers were shot, others were in hospitals. A month after the massacre, these women who live close to mining areas, to these mines, they organized their own march, demanding that the police leave their communities and stop harassing them and harassing their children. Because shortly after the Marikana massacre, police and the army moved into Marikana and they were just harassing everyone. People had to, if you were visiting Marikana, as I was visiting shortly after the Marikana massacre, we all had to leave the community before dark because the police would come and harass people. The police would come and um, just, just really uh, terrorize people in the community. So these women, because of all the things that were happening in the community, they started organizing themselves and they organized themselves. I think you can go to the next slide with lots of women or the previous slide. This is the group of women, the, the previous slide, a group of women uh, organized themselves under an organization association called Sikala Songke. And they were organizing not just one, but several marches demanding this immediate withdrawal of police from their community, demanding that they stop harassing, intimidating and unlawfully arresting people. And in trying to organize these marches, both after the Marikana massacre, but even now as they organize other marches around the community because nothing has changed in Marikana, they face resistance. They faced resistance even back then from public safety officials, from police. Some women were not just harassed, but others were even killed in organizing these protests and organizing these marches around their communities. And as I've already said, these women, again, they're the ones who were the first people to call and demand an impartial public judicial commission of inquiry into the Marikana massacre and calling for justice for workers justice for their community members, justice for themselves and their, and their families, especially for those who had been tortured and beaten up by the police. After calling alongside trade unions for this impartial public judicial commission of inquiry, indeed a commission of inquiry was established. Women again played a very central role after the establishment of this commission of inquiry. Workers, as I've already said, were injured, others were arrested, and the case went on for about two years, if not longer for others. It was women then who participated actively in this commission of inquiry. So it was not just the state, and it was not just employers saying what happened on that fateful day, but it was also women who were very central in that commission of inquiry. But the slow process of the commission, I mean, it took about two years from 2012 to about 2014. Women, men, some men after, sorry, some men after being released from hospital, they went back to work. Others after uh, being released from prison, they went back to work. So women are the ones who attended it every day for two years. And some women even had to give up their jobs because of going to the commission of inquiry, making sure that things were not misrepresented by those who were involved in the commission of inquiry. Some not only gave up looking for jobs, others lost their jobs. The slow process of the commission, two years in total, was a real frustration for workers and for women who were going there daily, yet they continued going there. But the sad thing about the Commission of Inquiry and what women talked about a lot in those two years of the Commission of Inquiry is that while it was about 
exposing the injustices of the system, while it was about really outlining and uncovering what happened on that fateful day in Marikana, it really, for them, they felt like it was re-entrenching those, uh, the injustices. One, because the commission of inquiry that was about, that was meant to bring about justice, it produced unemployment. Women had to stop going to work. They had to give up their jobs in order to be present in a commission that was supposed to take place over two months that ended up taking two years. So for them, they talk about the commission of inquiry as something that produced another kind of injustice. But also they felt that the commission of inquiry while it was supposed to be about workers, it was supposed to be about their families, it was supposed to be about their experiences on that day and around the Marikana massacre, they felt like it was actually about none of those things. It was the state displaying its legal muscle and forcing them to relieve the trauma. Because I mean, to see 34 dead bodies lying around in your small informal community with the government saying to police, you've done very well by shooting those minors, the trauma and having to relieve that for two years, and especially for those who were, uh, for the widows of the, the workers who had, were killed. So for them, the Marikana Commission of Inquiry, while it was supposed to bring about justice, it didn't do any of that. Instead, it, helped, it made them relieve their traumas through the replaying of videos from that day and through real life role play. In any case, these women continued going to this. They abandoned all their tasks and all their responsibilities for the sake of their community, for the sake of people who were directly affected by what happened in the Marikana massacre. So the actions of these women for those two years, I think it shows that these were not just women who were fulfilling domestic duties, but they, it reflects, I mean, going to a commission of inquiry for two years, the involvement pre, it reflects, I think, a higher commitment a closer identification, you see that these women really identified with these struggles for justice for Marikana. So it was not just a fulfillment of domestic duties or spousal duties. This is something that for these women was very close to their hearts. It was something that they personally identified with. Women engaged in the struggles. They didn't detach themselves uh, as, some, as is sometimes expected. And it was these women who boosted and maintained the morale of the community and of workers, thus enabling the strike in Marikana to continue for as long as it did. Because even after the Marikana massacre, the strike did not stop. Women continued. And when men were released, they too joined the strike. So they were very central. And all of the victories that came later on, the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry, even though it was not a success in its uh, uh, findings, uh, but also other things that happened because workers were ultimately given the demand that they had, the demand for a living wage, even though it didn't happen in 2012, it happened two years later. And in some shafts, it continues, workers continue to make these demands. But all of these big trees, it's impossible to imagine them without imagining the role, the central role that women played, especially in those few days after the Marikana massacre, where workers were really being hounded down by the police. Another thing when it comes to women, is that I've already mentioned that the slow process of the commission uh, is not, that the, the fact that the slow process of the commission further entrenched these injustices. But also for these women and for them, it was not just the fact that they had witnessed the Marikana massacre. I'm sorry, can I just be excused for a second so that I can switch on the light? It's nighttime, my sight, and I see it's getting dark. Apologies about that, Awa. No problem at all. Go ahead. Thank you. I don't know. I hope that's better. It is. It is good. Okay. So as I was saying, so for women then in Marikana, um, so there was the, this Marikana Commission of Inquiry, but there were other things that for them were also a sore point. The fact that they had no proper houses. They lived in makeshift shacks with holes and water sipping in the rain when it's raining, no electricity. The roads were in a dreadful condition. There was no sanitation for them. So. 
these demands for a living wage then, as I've already said, they really spoke to them. I think I, I've, I've, uh, I think I've re, uh, uh, I'm repeating myself there, but apologies. So there were also then, so they had gotten, so some workers got this 12,500, which is about 850, 900 US dollars that they were demanding. But the cost of social reproduction, which is what ties the story of 2012 to the story of 2021 or 2020, is that while they got that money that they were demanding, the living wage, the cost of social reproduction has also dramatically increased. That means the work that women do to sustain these communities, it's the cost of that work, it has gone up. So just to mention a few things, the services in Marikana, services for communities, and I want you again, as I talk about these, to keep in mind that this is the region that's producing about 40% of the world's platinum. There are no, there are very limited services for the community, but for the mines, there are abundant services. So small things that if you're living in a middle-class neighborhood, you will not even think about the presence of water pipes. They are all around the community, but none of these water pipes are servicing the community. These water pipes are directly servicing only the mines. So if you go to Marikana on any given day, you'll see people driving around in wheelbarrows looking for water. Women carrying 25 buckets of water, 25 liter buckets of water. Boys pushing wheelbarrows, women spending two hours, three hours waiting for water in long queues. In some of my visits to Marikana, I was really strike struck and I continue to be as I go back and forth to Marikana struck by just how long people spend queuing for water which is supposed to be a basic necessity basic basic thing that you need for survival the struggle for survival in Marikana despite the wealth so-called wealth underneath is really it's a regular tussle and it starts the minute women wake up it consumes so much of their time searching for water, uh, walking, waking up at odd hours between 2 a.m., 4 a.m. to look for places where there's water so that you can queue. Water taps are dripping bit by bit. Some taps are drying up. But for women, they have to get up and do this work. And I'm mentioning this, and I'm mentioning water in particular, because we tend to think of these women searching for water as something that's not really related to the mines, but in the case of these mining communities and these women, it's directly related to the mines. And in fact, it's directly related to the profits I started talking about. Because when there's no water in the households, workers cannot bath. And if they cannot bath, they cannot go to work. So water is actually a profit issue in these mines, even though the mines are not providing water for communities, it's women who have to do that. So women getting up at 2 a.m. to go look for water, it's indirect, it's to directly service these mines uh, and make them productive. But it's not just the water and these services, it's also the roads, the roads that lead to the shafts where there's the platinum, where they dig the platinum, they are properly serviced, but the, the roads that lead to the community, like I said earlier, this is just about 300 meters away apart from each other. Yet those roads are filled with ditches, potholes, and in other places, they're not even properly developed. There are a lot of stories I continue to hear when I do my research in Marikana of children falling and drowning in deep potholes, of cars not being able to drive out even when there's an emergency in the middle of the night, of Moog vans not being able to go pick up dead bodies, especially now with COVID, bodies living in communities, even being in communities uh, because it's raining and uh, the uh, emergency vehicles are not able to access uh, the communities, the informal settlement in particular. Women, in addition to taking care of these households and spreading thin the wages that their husbands are earning, they are constantly having to do all of this extra work 
that services the mines. And as I've already said, people are leaving in shacks and I'm not gonna dwell a lot on these shacks. I think there's a photograph that I've put up on shacks, but also the women will talk about those were in the video that I'll be playing just now. But in these shacks and in the stands where these shacks are built, you'll see sometimes about five to 12 or even 20 shacks with people inside them, families, different families, one shack serving as a kitchen, as a living room and as a bedroom. And sometimes in the yards where these shacks are located, you have about five, even 20 individuals sharing one pit toilet. And I think I have a photograph of a pit toilet there. I have quotes here, but I'm not gonna get into them because of time of women saying that uh, when it rains, because they're living in shacks, when it rains, and if it rains at night, they literally have to get up, stand in the middle of the house, of their, their shack, or move their beds to the center of the shack in order for them not to get wet. But they say that the problem is with the soft rain because you cannot hear the soft rain. It makes you fall into deep sleep. And when you wake up, your blankets are soaking wet. If it's raining, the shacks can be easily uprooted if it's windy, especially. Uh, all of these things, I'm mentioning them because I think that, again, going back to the fact that this is happening in Marikana, a place that's producing the world's uh, wealth, platinum, uh, platinum reserves, 40% of them being located in Marikana. I'm not going to talk about jobs and job exclusion of women, but those are also important things. Uh, important education, healthcare, and the issue with healthcare is is not just that women are doing all of this healthcare, even around the Marikana massacre, and to this day, and especially with COVID nineteen, women are doing a lot of this of work. They're carrying the burden of health care in these communities, mines take no responsibility whatsoever. With COVID, for instance, mines forced the, gov forced, for forced the government to let them open, and a lot of workers have been getting COVID, yet mines have nothing in place to take care of the workers who are getting infected. And if you're living in a shack and you're using the same small toilet that everybody else in a yard of 20, 30 people, is using, think about rate of transmission of COVID under those, so, but women, the most important point I wanna make here is that they're carrying this burden of care when the people in their communities, when their work, when workers fall sick. They're the ones who are doing all of the care work, not the mines, the mines abscond, they don't do any of this. There's another long quote here of women who are detailing how they continue to do the care work that is as a direct result in most cases of work that's happening in the mines, workers getting sick because of mine work, workers getting injured at work, in addition now to COVID and how women are doing all of that care work. So to talk about mines and to talk about these demands for living wages without talking about women for me is to do injustice to what's happening in these communities, especially in these mining communities. Uh, and I'm going to quickly jump and uh, try and conclude. So when we're talking about this, then in the case of South Africa, I get this uh, the justice for Marikana or social justice in the case of Marikana, it's against this degrading background that I've just given, uh, where workers, uh, con they, they have all of these rights in terms of the constitution, where workers are supposed to have rights to protest, where people are supposed to leave lives filled with dignity, but in reality, none of these things are happening. Workers, people, citizens, they're not protected at all. All the protections only exist in the constitution. They only exist on paper. The realities of people tell a different story and a very disheartening story. Our constitution, it says that if you open it, it says that it's meant to heal divisions of the past and establish a society that's based on democratic values on social justice and fundamental human rights. Yet what's happening in Marikana, what we're seeing in Marikana is not any of those, it's not social justice, it's not fundamental human rights being respected. What's happening in Marikana, as I've been saying, is this reinforcement of divisions created by the apartheid government, but it's also this reinforcement of divisions between workers and between them and their managers and so forth. In reality, people in Marikana, they fall outside the protection of our constitution. They seem to reside within what I see as the cracks of the constitution. While residing within these communities that supposedly have wealth, 
They are the forgotten people amid the squandering of resources and profiteering by mining companies with the state as monitors and regulators of these uh, activities. The conflicts and horrendous conditions in Marikana that people in Marikana live under are, a directly, are directly manufactured by mining companies, by the low pitiful wages that they are paying their workers. And in all of this, women have to fill the gaps, patch up, keep families going, communities operating, and most importantly, they help keep these mines productive. And I think I'm going to end it there and ask that you play the video and then maybe we can have a conversation afterwards. Awa, are you there? I'm not sure if it's Nicole who's going to play the video. Yeah, it's me. I'm pulling it up right now. Great. Go and see the hostel where these workers are confined. It will tell the story. How many fatalities this mine has? How many Section 54 in terms of mine health, I mean, uh, mine health and safety act have been commissioned to this mine? So that tells you a lot. Look at the road. Those roads are used daily by the community in terms of their social labor plan. What are they plowing back to this community? We only see the shacks around here. Where is their commitment? Huh? As long the bosses, senior management getting fat checks, that's good for them. And these workers yeah. subjected to poverty for life. This place is not a place for people. Emukuku is not a place to live. Because it doesn't have windows. No water. No toilets. No electricity. You expect to see houses, not Mukuku. This life we are living here, it's not a life, but we are living. Pleke yego dulang huyo, ha huna di zel, ha huna di toilet, ha gana makro, ha dulang ni kuku inelang eke na mitz. Inchela zala pa zimbi kuna manzi ungena na manzi mikuquini and fute nyinto kala ne toilet is a corner. Yo, 
ukubuhlungu kakhulu asina toilet asina mbane asina manzi si zinceda ehlathini xa kufanele ba mawuye e toilet The women would go five times to fetch water because there is washing to do, cooking and bathing. Sometimes there is no water at all. Then we just borrow uh, wheelbarrows for, from others, then we go and fetch water from the neighborhood. We need more water for a day. The children were hungry and others were being sent back because they had no school fees. Um, uh, Nicole, I'm not sure if it's done, Joanne. It stopped and I can't get it. It started all the way back at the beginning, so I'm not sure if it was done or yeah. what happened. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for playing that. Uh, that's a video uh, that was put together by the Center for Applied Legal Studies at the University of the Fed Patterson. So thanks to them for sharing it with us and for allowing me in particular to use it for such purposes. So I, just to conclude then, I think the, my, the, the point I'm trying to make is that mining in South Africa has not been this uh, success story that many want us to believe it has been. The case of Marikana as an event, uh, a massacre, and also the lived real, realities of people in Marikana, I think it shows uh, the shortcomings of the mining industry. Uh, it demonstrates how workers and how people and how women, all of us, how we are shortchanged even after sacrificing for workers and gambling with their lives underground for the benefit of the few. And I think Marikana in, in this case is not just about this particular community, but it represents many other communities in South Africa, many other communities in the global south where there's mining happening. So it's not just the story about South Africa, even though I'm using this case of South Africa. And it shows how people are downright forgotten or neglected by the state uh, and how mining companies alongside the state, how they choke aspirations of local people, how they make, for me anyway, this is my reading of it, how they make profits from the hard labor of people, not just those who are working inside the mines, but also the women who are outside the mines who are also working for these mines, as I've uh, already said, and I'm happy to demonstrate further in our Q&A, how they make profits from the hard labor of people in these communities, yet share none of the dividends. Uh, and instead, they take uh, and siphon off these returns, uh, these profits, and uh, enjoy them with shareholders. 
uh, even in post-apartheid South Africa, what we're seeing with the story of Marikana is that black people, poor people, they continue to be exploited even in post-apartheid South Africa. And I think that's the sad part about the country uh, is that there's very little progress uh, or prospects for redress even in post-apartheid South Africa. And women in these cases, while they're not at the coal face in most of them, they continue to carry the heavy burden, absorbing all of the shocks that the mines um, direct to workers and their communities. Um, yeah, I think I'll end it there and then we can have a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Benya. That was fascinating. Uh, seeing the exploitation that's heartbreaking, but also the resistance of women. Uh, we have many questions, so I'm just going to go right to the questions. And we have one question from Peter Penner. I'm glad you mentioned the positive rights constitution of South Africa. I am curious to know whether there have been any efforts to litigate in the courts. Has this been tried? What are the prospects of for redress? Should I answer that? Yes. Uh, I won't be able to answer it fully, but yes, and, and yes. Um, so the Center for Applied Legal Studies, the people who've uh, produced the video we've just watched. They have working very closely with the women. Uh, trade unions have tried, but not very successfully, especially after the Commission of Inquiry released its report. There was a plan to push that, especially the, or the trade union called AMCU, where, uh, that, that organized a lot of workers in 2012, and that continues to organize workers in that region, but not much success really. Uh, in terms of uh, going the court route. But there's, I mean, I'm happy to share other things. So the women, for instance, um, uh, but not, that's, this is not directly around litigation, but uh, the women, they, they try to take Lonman to court. Um, I forget, and I think because Lonman had gotten money, Lonman is the mining company actually, but now it's no longer London. They've sold it off to another one, Sabanya Gold, and London's moved back to London. Um, they tried to take them to court. Uh, that was also not very successful. But I mean, we're talking about resistance, as you were saying, our, um, these women tried to fight these women. And it's just a group of about 20 women in the formal organization. But in the community, there's a lot of women, obviously. But they tried to take London to court because, as the, uh, the, the trade union leader says at the beginning, there are social and labor plans that have, are put in place. And when mining companies, when companies are borrowing money from the World Bank, IMF, they need to commit to certain things. And these mining companies, this one in particular, they made commitments that they never fulfilled and women were taking them to court to force them to fulfill, but it was never successful, it fell through. Thank you. Uh, so a question from Philip Effion, Asanda. This is reminiscent of the destruction of, the destruction of lives and communities by oil communities in Nigeria. In South Africa, is government or any political leaders doing anything to address the problem? Definitely not. I mean, the mining companies are in bed with the state. Uh, so our current president in South Africa, in 2012, when the Marikana massacre happened, he was on the board of the company, of the mining car, of Lonman, Lon, Lonman. Uh, and he's the current president. He was voted into power soon after the Marikana massacre. Uh, and he has never taken any responsibility. So for them to do anything, it's, they've not done anything. That's the bottom line, uh, especially the political leaders. Um, to address the problems. I mean, like I've said at the end, we have this constitution that says that the government is, is, is responsible for providing people with services, with all the things that we need for basic survival, but even the constitution is just there. No one's doing much about it, but people are, I, I'm not 
I don't want to give an impression that well the government is not doing anything and people people continue to demand what's due to them people continue to demand decent lives so while the government is not really responding people are not phased they continue to go out on the streets and march demanding basic services so if you check some of the South African some of the literature coming out of South Africa around protests movement and so forth social movements it shows that we are one of the we are so active as a country in terms of uh, protests but uh, there's not much that's happening uh, in terms of addressing the problems that people including I mean if the state responded by killing workers uh, I think that says a lot about whether they're even interested in addressing some of these problems but I'm saying not much interest because they are benefiting directly from the dysfunction they're benefiting directly from the exploitation of workers as I've said the current president was on the board of lawnmen previously hmm. and just to follow up on that I found it interesting at the beginning of your talk when you talk about German like taking since the governments are not doing much so you talk about uh, holding shareholders accountable and I was just wondering if you can share a little bit what's been done or what's what people in Germany that you reference what are they doing okay sure um a lot actually uh, one soon after the Marikana massacre uh activists from Germany they were they came down to South Africa to see who in Germany is investing in these mining companies uh, and they try to put pressure on those mining companies back in Germany. So buying shares in those companies in order to sit uh, at AGMs of those companies. These are activists, these are NGOs, some are German NGOs, others are international NGOs based in Germany. Buying shares uh, in order to sit at AGMs and at AGMs to raise issues, taking activists from South Africa to attend those AGMs, uh, making sure that in the age. So it's that kind of activism. And I think things shifted. Um, I mean, I've not followed up lately what's been happening, but things did shift in terms of just people in Germany, even knowing about it, the German government, knowing that they too are indirectly responsible or indirectly, uh, yeah, they were part of it some way, some of the companies in Germany. So that's some of the work that activists were doing um, and just also going to different spaces in Germany with activists and talking about the Marikana massacre, because people also tend to think that, oh, no, it's something that happened in South Africa. It's got nothing to do with any of us. And I think the work that activists were doing on the ground was to say, actually, hang on, where is where are your pension funds going? Who's funding what that you are involved in? Just making sure that people know about it and know how they are somewhat implicit or directly affected well you know contributing or uh directly or indirectly um yeah maybe financing some of these companies that are operating in south africa without even knowing about them thank you so much uh one question uh when you say the cost of social reproduction have increased significantly can you give examples yeah, um, I mean, in the past few, so when I'm talking about the social reproduction, I'm not sure if I, I was able to get that clearly out, uh, but the social reproduction work that people, that women in particular are doing, so in the case of Marikana, for example, the fact that taps have been running dry for the past few years, so talking about government, are they doing anything, not even providing people with water, yet there is water going to the mines and the government makes sure that there's water going to the mines. If taps are constantly running dry, it means that women are having to go to neighboring communities to get water. And again, in the case of South Africa, going to a neighboring community at 2 a.m. to look for water. Firstly, these are not women who are remunerated for this, yet what they're doing, uh, as I was saying earlier, directly benefits the mines. So getting up at 2 a.m. to go look for water in a neighboring community so that workers are on time for work and that they're able to be productive in a way with the taps running dry for me, it means that work, women are doing more of that work. That's not the only work. We've seen a lot of injuries also happening at work, a lot of retrenchments we've seen with injuries. I mean, again, it directly impacts what happens in the household. The worker is retrenched, especially if it's a work and mines don't, 
just don't want to take responsibility, especially if it's a worker who's a contractor. But even if it's a worker who's not a contractor, mines say, do not tell, do not report the injury underground as an example. Don't report this injury underground, uh, we will take care of you. But you don't report the injury underground and you send home and the mine doesn't take care of you, who takes care of you? It's your wife. In some cases, that wife has to stop going to work. And in some cases, she has to take the money that is already very little, uh, that was supposed to support the family to take care of your medical bills. And and the mind doesn't take any so that kind of social reproduction work uh, that we've seen increasing with all of the increases in production targets being like workers the demands for production being high it means that we are also seeing a lot of accidents happening underground with a lot of accidents happening underground people getting injured it means that the work that women are doing uh, also goes up but i mean there were also a lot of other small examples that women used to make uh, when I was like, give me small examples. Um, when I was doing research on this particular social reproduction issue, and they would say how even a machine that breaks underground, it changes their rhythms, their patterns at home. Because if a machine breaks underground, it changes the rhythms or the patterns or the work uh, process of the worker. And by virtue of that person's work changing or demands on them changing, there's extra demands on them. So if there's a shaft or a lift, a cage that breaks underground and workers are supposed to be at home early, it means the woman has to keep cook an extra meal, maybe something that she doesn't usually do. So there's many ways in which this social reproduction work has increased for people, uh, for women in particular. And with COVID, there's even more of that. People going to work, coming back infected, infected by with COVID and then they have to take, they have to stay at home. Who takes care of them? How do you do that in that check? So that's what I meant by social reproduction work and how it has increased recently. Thank you. Uh, there are some comments in the chat. So Philip say, Asanda Benya, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. It is extremely important to revisit the role and victimization of women in resistance struggles, whether in historical experiences like colonialism or in more recent work-related struggles as you have demonstrated. Even in the US, not much is known about the murder of unarmed black females by the police. Again, thank you. And we have another comment here. Thank you colleague in scholarship and for an insightful presentation. I have two in one question and a comment. How important were the migration and citizenship elements in your research? This question is based on the general knowledge of the Slend Americana mine workers and their settled and deeply affected families as people from outside of the Northwest province, that is Eastern Cape, as well as South Africa, that is Lesotho. My comment is that perhaps you can zone in on the Bonola District Municipality Mining region in your map to show where the Maricana settlement is actually located in the province in relation to the platinum mine. Thank you once more. Mm -hmm. And you also, yeah. So people say thank you for sharing. Yeah, maybe if you might, if you want to address the question about the migration and citizenship question. Uh, yeah. uh, Sure. Uh, actually, this person's question sounds like he's read a paper I wrote about that map of Bojanala district. Um, migration, I mean, in Marikana, so when we're talking about migrants in South Africa or migration in South Africa, there's two ways we, we talk about it based on the past. One, the internal migrants, uh, they're considered migrants in some areas because previously under apartheid governments, they were considered to be part of different locations like the former Bantu stands, Bantu stands, they called them. So some of the provinces that post-apartheid have become part of South Africa. So migration and migrants in that sense that mines have also always relied on migrant labor. It's hardly ever been locals working in mines. There's always been people coming from these so-called labor sending areas. So migration, I think anyone who's looking at mining, it, it's part of the mining story of South Africa. You cannot talk about workers without talking about migration, precisely because of how 
minds uh, and their development, workforce, where it came from, all of that, how it was structured. But then there's also, I mean, especially during apartheid South Africa, but that continues in post-apartheid South Africa, that a lot of workers, well, they are from parts of South Africa, these labor sending areas, they're also from neighboring countries. So Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, especially Malawi, even though in Malawi they stopped coming in the 1970s legally or formally. They've been now, I hate the word legally when you're talking about people okay. moving within a continent, but they've also been coming informally. So you have migrants from the rest of the region. Um, but alongside that migration story, I'm not sure how to talk about citizenship because I think it's such a contested term in, in South Africa and in the mining industry in particular. But alongside that uh, migration story, what you also see in mining, so you have all people coming from different parts of the region, but you also have the price of gold in the late 1990s or mid 1990s, late 1990s, price of gold going down and you have a lot of workers being retrenched and alongside that retrenchment of workers what we also saw was a lot of new contractors coming up and these contractors coming from the rest of the region and in some cases being the workers who had just been retrenched so that retrenchment people coming back as contract workers contract labor with insecure contracts also meant that uh, the workers who were once upon a time united are no longer united because those who are not retrenched, so the ones who were retrenched but coming back as contractors as taking away their jobs. But what this meant during the Marikana massacre was that a lot of the people who were in the front lines were people who had these uh, formal standard employment relations or contracts and not so much those who didn't. And people felt like, well, people from other parts of the continent are not participating in strikes and it caused a lot of struggles between workers from different parts of the, uh, the region, but also workers who have different contracts. So when we're talking about the migration stories, there's multiple layers to that story. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I'm ho I hope that I'm, I'm demonstrating that it's a very complex layered issue that has a particular history in the mining industry in South Africa. Thank you. Uh, another question from John Doyle Rosso. Thank you very much for this presentation. Because the strike began on National Women's Day, it is particularly interesting to hear about how women organized it as well as the hospital care and activism that followed the massacre. My question is, were memories and narratives about the women's anti apartheid protests of August 9th 1956, which inspired the creation of the public holiday, part of the 2012 strike. And in subsequent years, have the day involved activities or remembrance related to 2012 strike and massacre? Uh, so I'll answer the first part uh, about narratives, where the, uh, where the narratives, memories and narratives about the women's anti-apartheid protest are part of Yes. Uh, and I think not just Marikan, I think in South Africa, there's just the person sounds again, like they know a lot about South Africa, John Doe Russell, um, that in South Africa, I mean, if there's any, anything that involves women, there's always that Watinda Bafazi, Watinda Mpokodo, you touch a woman, you strike a woman, strike a rock. So those kind you know, so that kind of stuff was there even after the Marikana massacre uh, in women's uh, or in the organizations that women formed, but also as they were demanding uh, the release of workers from uh, who, were, who had been imprisoned shortly after the massacre, uh, as they were outside the court demanding that police leave their communities again, some of the things from the 1956 strikes. There were, I mean, the narrative or memories coming, not memories in a direct sense, but people really drawing connections that actually you've not just touched these men, you've not just touched the workers, you've touched us, the women, us, the ones who are keeping these communities going. Uh, so going back to 1956, making those kind of indirect, well, direct actually connections with them. And then the second part of uh, 
and in subsequent years as the day evolved uh, activism or remembrance related to I mean yes it has evolved but I think what's also been happening is that the union the national the, not the national union of fine records sorry AMCU, which is the trade union that's been organizing a lot around that area now, um, it's sort of turned Marikana into their own thing. So there's a lot of tussles around the area around remembering uh, that day in particular with the union feeling like it's their thing and with community members feeling like it's their thing and with widows feeling like, hey, we are here. They were our husbands or they were our fathers or they were our brothers, we've been forgotten. It's all of you men fighting over this day as a way of scoring political points. So there's also been a bit of that. Um, I don't think I'm fully answering your question, John, but. Uh... Thank you, Benya. Uh, one question here. Could you talk a little about how music plays a role in the progress of this woman? Thank you. Uh, well, that's definitely not my area, Paul. <laughs> but, but actually, um, I, I had an exhibition a couple of two years ago, and I was so struck by just how much music has been, not just these women. I mean, if you listen to the songs and you understand what the songs are about, you'll see the connections between the politics, the living conditions, and the songs. They're not just general songs. They're songs that women... Um, write, or, well, not write in this case, but uh, compose out of their, you know, based on their living conditions, their lived experiences. But as I was saying earlier, I was really struck when I had this exhibition, uh, just how much music there is actually around Marikana. And when you listen to it and you listen to the tempo, the beat of the music, it's, if you were in Marikana, if you know about Marikana, it's really so, it's, it's a really moving music. And also just to encourage people, if you've not seen a documentary by Riyadh Desai on the Marikana massacre, I encourage you to, to, to watch it. It's not the story of women. It focuses on men and it focuses on the hill, but it's still in terms of music, it's got beautiful, beautiful music that even when you don't understand the language, but if you understand the story of Marikana um, and you love music, you will be moved by it and you, you well, you support the struggle of the struggles of workers and working class people, you'll be moved by the music. Um, but music is not my area, so I can't say more than that. Uh, one comment that I think speaks for all of us a very moving presentation of the in it's by Leo Zulu, a very moving presentation of the injustices surrounding mining and how governments often side with the mining corporations at the expense of their own people and corporate social responsibilities included in agreements to take care of mining communities are rarely implemented and companies are rarely held accountable. The gender dimension of these injustices and particularly highlighting the role of women was powerful. And I, I totally agree with that comment and I think many of us do, so thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Asanda Benya for coming today and, and, and sharing with us. And if we don't have any more questions, so let's give it a minute or two. But that was really, really moving. And as you said, it's not just a story that's happening in South Africa, it's everywhere. So we, we can relate. <laughs> And I think that's 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 all. We don't have any more questions. So thank you again, Dr. Benya. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. <laughs> and thank, thank you so much. Attending. It was wonderful. And thank you to everybody else who, who attended. So please join us next Thursday at 12. Bye.